thanks again for this uh, recognition. I'm, I'm really happy to be able to share with you a little bit of a different um, style of talk than I'm normally used to giving. Give you a, a little background about where I came from, um, a little bit about my philosophy and, and how I'm approaching doing science in the uh, process research group at Merck. So I, I, I grew up in a really small town in central Pennsylvania. I went to an equally small uh, liberal arts school where I had some really great advisors who inspired me to pursue a career in research. And so I did my PhD at Colorado State with Tom Rovis, mainly working on asymmetric catalysis. And in 2012, um, when I finished there, I was really fortunate enough to join the uh, Merck process group in Rahway, New Jersey, where I'm currently leading the catalysis uh, lab there. So one thing that really brought me to Merck and has really kept my attention as I've um, uh, transitioned into my career here is really its long legacy of innovation and invention, not only in the field of medicine, but also in the field of uh, basic synthetic chemistry. So over the last 125 years or so, um, Merck as a company and actually as the Rawway site, um, there's been some really amazing uh, breakthrough discoveries um, at, this, at this site and in this company that really changed uh, the course of human history in some cases and something that I think we're uh, definitely proud to be a part of. And equally inspiring is some of the words from our founder, George Merck, who to kind of use his words is, you know, our mission is really to bring our finest achievements um, in what we do to, to everyone who needs it. I think this is something that um, has definitely um, inspired me. I think equally important, though, is how we choose to fulfill that, that mission, um, you know, and that, this global health challenge. So we need to be extremely cognizant about how our actions are actually affecting things like the environment and actually the society as a whole, um, and make sure that we're not doing more harm than good. And so at Merck, we're really starting to build the ideals into our processes uh, to be able to achieve um, our long-term goals of environmental sustainability um, and allow our processes to be really world-class and um, allow us to um, uh, rely on them for, for global supply. And actually, uh, earlier this year, uh, one of the uh, Merck process teams was actually recognized down here with the Presidential Green Chemistry Award for their, their work on a, on a process. So our mission um, in, in process research is really to create the ideal process. And this normally always stems from the best chemistry, but the ideal process also encumbers a lot of other ideals um, and make it very important um, and, and commercially relevant, which is robustness, cost, safety, um, all of these things. But at the end of the day, we're really looking to innovate simple solutions to solve these problems. So I'd like to give you just a little bit of my philosophy um, in, in science in general and how this has kind of been shaped by my experiences, not only in my graduate career, but, but as I uh, had transitioned into a career in industry. So what I've always liked about science is that you really don't need to be smart to, to pursue science. Um, and knowledge isn't really a prerequisite for science. And really one of the most important things that I think you can do as a scientist is be a, a very keen observer. Um, and really understand what you're doing. And sometimes I think uh, words like luck and serendipity kind of get incorporated in a negative connotation um, when you know, great things are discovered, when maybe things don't go quite according to plan. But I guess I would argue that if you're doing these experiments with a specific intention in mind, then this isn't really luck, this is just science at its best. So I'll give you a couple um, examples from my graduate studies that. I think are, are important to share, and, and I definitely learned a lot of lessons um, uh, kind of in humility um, in this way. And one of the main projects that we were focused on is being able to solve the problem of very challenging intermolecular uh, acyl anion chemistry um, catalyzed by carbenes. And it really took some, some big strides in um, creativity and catalyst design before we were able to actually accomplish our goals here. And while this maybe looks a bit esoteric, you know, why would we want to put this fluorine atom on the backbone of a catalyst? We had some ideas as to why we thought that would perturb the system in the right direction. And as you can see here, our initial um, catalysts were not that successful. 
But what we didn't anticipate is, is such a large effect on the stereochemistry, and our, our hypotheses did not really account for this. So for a different reason, um, you know, some of these experiments really changed the course of the rest of my, my PhD and allowed us to solve some really uh, challenging problems, uh, really just because we went outside of, uh, and you know, weren't siloed into our thinking. And the story continues when we were looking at more challenging substrate combinations, we were faced with a similar uh, dilemma, and unfortunately, what we had learned about this previous system really didn't seem to apply here. Uh, but again, for a completely different reason, it turns out that now the opposite stereochemistry in this catalyst um, turned out to, to give us remarkable uh, results and again solved a really challenging problem. And I'll leave you with, with one last example which I found uh, extremely frightening in some aspects. And that's that in this reaction we found that this catalyst that we had developed previously gave very good selectivity but the turnover was very low. And uh, we had reasons to try to add different co-catalysts. And this uh, result here, by the addition of catechol, was actually the first experiment that I ran. Um, and this totally solved the problem, increased turnover. But what's, you know, the scary part here is that what I actually meant to, to try that day was phenol, but it didn't turn out to be on the shelf. Someone was using it, I couldn't find it. Catechol was there in its place. Um, and I can't say that if I would have tried phenol first that I would have ever discovered this reaction. So the point is that you really never know, you know how close you are to a big discovery. And I think that you really need to cast your net of, of creativity and experiments wide enough to make sure that you, you don't miss these type of things. So one of the ways that we're approaching this at Merck is just to accelerate um, you know, the scientific method, to ask more questions and, and get, gather more data quickly. And the way that we're doing that is through a combination of high throughput and data rich experimentation um, in the forefront. And then we couple that with uh, machine learning and some new computational resources to be able to use predictive sciences in designing our new catalysts and processes. So the real power in high throughput experimentation isn't in the ability to just randomly mix chemicals and hope that you find something interesting. I think the real power is in the fact that you can not only try the experiments that you think might have the best chance of working, might have the most literature precedent, but also all the permutations of those experiments. And most importantly, you can really <clears throat> cast that wide net of questions with your creativity and your, your chemical intuition. And so on the back end, just as important is to be able to analyze and collect data from these experiments as fast as, as you're generating them. And so we use a lot of high throughput uh, analysis techniques uh, to be able to do that. So right about the time that I, I joined Merck, we really started getting interested in being able to use photocatalysis in our processes. And one way in which we try to enable uh, the development and accelerate the discovery of these in this context was uh, through the use of high throughput experimentation. And I'll just give you a couple examples of how we were able to uh, make some uh, major breakthroughs in, in process development with this tool. In one case, uh, the synthesis of odanacatib, which was uh, a CAT-K inhibitor for the treatment of osteoporosis, contains this fluorinated uh, leucine amino acid building block, which was originally made in about nine chemical steps. And really what we wanted to look at was you know, the best starting material and convert that directly to the fluorinated amino acid. And we were able to do that by collaborating with a group at Simon Fraser University and found a, a very selective photocatalytic fluorination reaction, which provided this raw material in a single step. <clears throat> and another example, to make this um, chiral indoline uh, core for the synthesis of Elbisphere, an HCV inhibitor, uh, we were able to replace a very um, inefficient metal-based oxidant with a very environmentally benign peroxide-based oxidant uh, with the same type of selectivity and yield that we were looking for in these processes. And some of these early um, discoveries really led to the development of our own uh, photoreactors. Uh, in this case, a, a benchtop reactor that's now being distributed across the Merck network, as well as some manufacturing scale reactors that really hadn't been available at the time to allow us to pilot some of these processes on, on manufacturing scale. So leave, I'll leave it to, with one last um, a story of verbosprevir, which is an NS5B inhibitor for the treatment of, of HCV. So this is a protide therapy, or pronucleotide. And the reason it's called a, a pronucleotide is because it contains this chiral phosphoramidate portion um, on the nucleoside core. 
And the reason this is there is that this allows it to be incorporated into the cell and phosphorylated to the active triphosphate, which is actually what's responsible for the therapeutic effect. But this is actually a pretty challenging uh, compound to make uh, efficiently on manufacturing scale. And our initial supply route to this compound was 12 steps and only about 1% overall yield. So you can imagine this comes with um, the generation of a substantial amount of waste. And uh, it's kind of fun to, to do some of these um, you know, numbers. If you were to be able to make enough of this to potentially cure the disease, you'd be generating about 10 million metric tons of waste in the process, which is a pretty substantial number. And really, just through innovations in synthetic chemistry, um, the team's been able to reduce this to a five-step synthesis and about 50% overall yield. So I want to just, just briefly describe um, one of the development projects for a, a particular uh, strategic disconnection, which was in the installation of this um, peak chiral phosphoramidate prodrug, in which there were no catalytic ways to install that uh, previously. And we wanted to be able to do that from very inexpensive commodity raw materials. And that commodity raw material is this racemic chlorophosphoramidate. So this can be prepared as a mixture of phosphorus diastereomers very inexpensively. And we hope that in a dynamic process, we could convert all of this material to the desired uh, isomer of uprobosphavir. So we started with a very um, simple HDE approach, which identified a catalyst that was um, quite selective uh, for the desired phosphorus stereochemistry, um, but, but the turnover was not um, economically feasible. And so we really dug into why this catalyst in particular stood out from our um, initial rounds of experimentation and found some interesting kinetic behavior that explained some of the function. And so this allowed us to generate some hypotheses as to what was actually going on in this uh, chemistry. And using computation, um, we actually were able to build a model that really supported our initial uh, mechanistic hypotheses and through uh, this model then uh, bring this into a predictive sciences mode which allowed us to invent some, some new catalysts that were almost perfectly selective for generating the desired um, a pro drug that we were interested in. And what I'll leave it with is really just the amount of time that it, it takes to do these type of computations. So this total project took about 108 CPU years to, to complete. Um, and in some cases, right now, this is really the bottleneck in, in this development process. And this is something that we're really trying to invest in and I think will be a, a really useful uh, tool going forward in being able to rapidly uh, develop these type of uh, innovative processes um, in our industry. So with that, I'll just thank uh, everyone. Thanks for listening. I, uh, I really appreciate uh, you know, my, my advisor, Tom Robus, who is a really great mentor. I'll acknowledge some of the people that worked on the Uprovosivir process with me. And uh, some of these people have just been really great uh, mentors uh, for me um, at Merck. And with that, thanks.